next up we have Kyle. Now Kyle is an amazing data skeptic. He runs Data Skeptic Podcast. And I reached out to, uh, back in the day, Kyle was reminding me of the story, I'd forgotten how I met him. He lives in Santa Monica down there, right? That area down the southern part of California, we sometimes consider California, where they named their highways, they called them the highway, whatever. whatever. So Kyle, apparently, a long time ago, I reached out to podcasters and things on Twitter, back in the day when it was Twitter, and I had said, hey, your name of your podcast is The Data Skeptic. If you want to interview me for something, I'll be happy to be on your podcast. And apparently, that was a, he said, oh, wow, okay. I don't know who this person is, but I'll interview her. <laughs> So what we're going to hear today, Kyle has the lone um, honor of being the only person who's been at every single one of our Monterey County Skeptics talks. And he has always got something interesting in you. Know, one year he gave us a wonderful talk on data for a, um, called the Missing 411 Conspiracy. I'd never heard of it before. We recorded the talk and he wrote an article for Skeptical Inquirer. And it's our most viewed video on our YouTube channel, 800 or 1,000 views. Almost all of them are negative comments because <laughs> the man who did the conspiracy uh, that he, he talks about sent all his followers over to hate the video. But it's the most viewed video. So, you know, if they're going to watch a video, let's let it be one that is uh, critiquing their conspiracy theory. It's quite interesting. So, you got to check that out. So, um, Kyle, I think you're ready. Are you like that? He's going to be talking about artificial intelligence, I believe. Maybe Kyle's doing the talking. See, look closely to see if his mouth is moving because it might not be him doing the talking. It might be, you know, I don't know. Maybe he's got it synced real well. I don't know. So, this is a shorter talk. I think it's 30 minutes, right? All right, let's go. Thank you, everybody. I am not a historian of the Apollo project, but as far as I know, when they considered how you get to the moon, they didn't consider a staircase. <laughs> now, admittedly, it's probably not going to work. I think we all know that. But if you're really committed to it, you'd make a lot of progress along the way. There'd probably be innovations in material science and construction techniques, maybe better treading as you get way up there. But somehow we know a staircase isn't getting us to the moon. So. To carry the analogy forward, are the things we're doing today, the amazing advancements we're seeing in facial recognition, speech to text, text to speech, deep fakes, all this kind of stuff, are these interesting small innovations or are these on the path towards artificial general intelligence? And I put that G in there to mean general because that's sort of the holy grail or the moonshot, if you will, of computer science. How do we build a machine that not only does intelligent things but thinks like a human being does, or at least can imitate the thinking of a human being. Or will it ever be conscious? These sorts of questions are becoming quite contemporary. Uh, if you think back to before we had flight, no one knew how flight was going to work. There were a lot of crazy ideas. I'm sure you've all seen some of those weird videos with the uh, strange planes that kind of crash right away. And then we figured out the general design, and we iterated on it, and we improved upon it. But from the Wright brothers to the present, yes, it's changed a lot, but the path was sort of clear. It wasn't like we suddenly switched over to making uh, flapping wing planes at any point or something like that. So where are we with AI? Uh, uh, long, long ago, in 2018, this book came out called The Master Algorithm, outlined five general ideas, approaches or schools of thought that are common in artificial intelligence. Um, there are the five, but uh, just to give you an example, the evolutionaries is one I think everybody can understand. It appeals to biology and using the techniques of evolution, but it can be used in other ways. I did a project in college that was about optimizing what an ideal train configuration could be. A train can have an engine, it can have passenger cars, dining cars, freight cars, a, um, a caboose, I guess. And uh, so the solution to a train problem is some sequence of cars. Uh, a sequence that has the engine near the back is a really bad design. A sequence with the engine at the front is a good design. Uh, passenger cars need to be near dining cars and things like that from a couple of simple rules 
The description of a train is just what cars you have, and you can evaluate how much money am I going to make off of this. The train configurations that make a lot of money, you keep around for the next round. Maybe you breed them by cutting them in half and gluing them together, or just randomly mutating them, and others that aren't working you throw away. So we model this process mathematically off of what happens in evolution. And you know, you could say it's not a perfect analogy, but that technique works quite well in a lot of situations. Is it the path towards AGI? Will we have to evolve it? After all, we came through a natural process that just nature and evolution did. Perhaps we need the same thing to get to AI. It doesn't seem like that's true anymore. We kind of all agree that uh, this paradigm called the connectionist is the path forward. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what connectionists think. Uh, the term neural network, or deep neural networks, deep learning, all the same thing, work off of this one basic model. So see these, uh, what do I have? Six circles with some lines between them also described with some pretty basic equations. I think everybody can kind of get this. Uh, this is the simplest of neural networks. These X nodes are your inputs. So uh, in perception, that would be a single pixel's value. But if it were like a, um, I don't know, credit worthiness score, it could be your credit score and how many months overdue or something you are like that. And then these weights, which are just a, a nice little math trick, multiply the value times that number and add them up to the next square. And then I have this last one. In, in practice, we wouldn't really do an average like that, but just so everyone, I think, can uh, understand this a little bit better. Average out values, h1, h2, and h3. If you can do these simple math equations, you can do AI, although you're going to be slow at it. Machines are really fast. What's pictured here is what we call a three-layer neural network. One, two, three, the columns are the layers. And there are six parameters, because all these w values I didn't give them to you. They have to be figured out. What is the optimal value so that this math equation gives us a really good answer? So three layers, six parameters. GPT-4, which many of you may talk to if you go to ChatGPT, it has 96 layers and 175 billion parameters. So a lot harder to do that math by hand. In fact, practically impossible. Um, but it's the same simple idea. Algebra and arithmetic scaled up. Um, let's compare the human brain to these systems. Now, it's not a direct comparison, uh, but here's some brain sizes. Interesting, I thought humans had the most neurons. Apparently, it's elephants. Hmm. And not just by a little bit more, because this is a log scale, just like uh, how earthquakes work. Up here in the corner, hard to read, but I put in the true scale. Elephants have more than double the neurons humans have. So, hmm. I guess they're the dominant species in some sense. Um, but if we now think, now a neuron is not the same as a parameter. Parameter is a number, a neuron is a biological thing. But if we look at some of the popular language models that have come out in the last couple of years, again log scale, we see a tremendous growth in the number of parameters that are being used in these systems. And as we increase those parameters, we get more value out of it. So you can double your budget for the staircase to the moon, and at some point you're not going to double your return. You're not getting there. But with AI, we haven't really found a ceiling yet. More horsepower, more compute, more money, more data. It always seems to pay off. Now if we compare these two, already GPT-4 has more parameters than my brain has neurons, or an elephant's brain has neurons. So they didn't exceed us. Uh, a neuron isn't a parameter, but we're certainly on some gradient towards something. So broadly what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is what the heck happened recently in AI? I'm sure everyone in here can remember a time when like text-to-speech was laughably bad and now it's almost better than our own ears at times. Uh, a little bit about what other leaps we might see and how close we are to that moonshot of artificial general intelligence. Why now? Why has this stuff started happening in the last few years? And there's three simple answers. The first is hardware, uh, the GPU, the Graphical Processing Unit, a horribly named thing, originally invented for games so that they could render uh, you know, uh, the elaborate 3D scenes in real time at a high frame rate, doing things massively in parallel. Uh, after gaming built up that technology, it was discovered that that also worked really, really well for the fundamental math we do in AI. So we repurposed the graphical processing unit to do uh, the, set, the sort of training that's necessary to make the AIs we see today. Of course, the availability of big data, essentially the whole internet, to train these things on has been a big step forward. 
And then a few algorithmic advancements that I'll talk about, mainly this thing called the transformer, but also something called diffusion. So what caused the leap forward, AKA how do you solve AI? The basic process is here, recipe of four steps. You define a particular math problem, you use the machine learning techniques we already have to solve it, you run those techniques for possibly hundreds of compute years. That seems a little off, right? How did we get it in a short period of time? It's because all of this is done in parallel. If I take a thousand machines for one hour, or let's do this easier, 365 machines running for a day, that's one compute year. If you can distribute this stuff as we can easily with AI, you can get these insanely long training times. Now, something's not quite right there. A human being develops language in what, five to 10-ish years, something like that? I don't know how many kids, I don't know exactly. But uh, the machines develop it in a day or two. But also, they require hundreds of compute years to do that. So something's gonna have to get figured out there. Or maybe they just have a slower process to get over a milestone, who knows? Um, once you have that, the output is what we call a model. It's a trained model. It's a digital artifact that then can be used to inference new ideas, to create new images, to write new text, all of those sorts of things based on what it learned before. So let's define that particular math problem. What are we going to ask our computer to solve that somehow just spits out an intelligent thing? Um, I'll give you one quick example, then we'll go into the more uh, fundamental one. This is a cat, as you can see on the left. On the right is what you call white noise. It's when you just sort of randomize an image. And if you go into any of your popular Photoshop or programs like that, you can add noise to an image, as I've done here, left to right. Added more noise, basically destroying the true information content of it. The actual cat is blurred and obscured as we go to the right. So ask a computer a simple process. Ask it to learn how to remove the noise. Now, you can't do that perfectly. You actually destroy part of the original information in the image when you noise it up. But any of us could you know, take this image and maybe, or a skilled graphic designer anyway, could go in there and clean that up, kind of get it close to what the original was just by looking at neighboring colors and tweaking it and stuff like that. So ask a computer to learn this undo function. How do you remove noise? It gets really good at that. And then the idea was to start with a noisy image like this and say, this is a cat. Undo the noise, make it look more like a cat. And out of thin air emerges a process of removing, removing, removing iteratively until noise shapes into a realistic image like this one on the left. And that's the fundamental idea in all of the amazing image generation technology wow. we've been seeing the last couple years. It's just take out the noise and then start from noise and say, find the original image. <laughs> wow. For text, the problem's a little trickier, but the core innovation is this idea called the missing word prediction, or what you'll hear called next word prediction. So let's just take the first one. You guys can run these in your head if you want. Every morning, she goes for a blank in the park. A walk, yeah, a jog, a hike. Um, notice walk, jog, hike. These are all not the same thing, but similar ideas. So when a word can fit a similar blank, we know it's similar. He went to the blank because he was hungry. Kitchen, restaurant, grocery store, pantry. These are related ideas, not the same idea, but words that can fill the same blank have a similarity to them. So there's a sub-problem here to solve. Okay, computers work on binary, they're all chips and whatnot. How do you convert a word to a phrase, or a word or a phrase into a number? Because machines only work on numbers. There's a lot of ways to do this. Some of you might recognize this as an ASCII table. It's how real deep in the uh, system of your computer, individual characters are encoded as numbers. So that's a simple way to map from like over here in the alphabet into a somewhat arbitrary number that is just universally known. Um, another way would be to take the dictionary and start at the beginning and label words one, two, three, four, five in their order. Now this is useful because you know, you know the sequence of them, you could quickly find out if a word's in the dictionary using binary search, but there's no context to this, you know. Nothing about aardvark relates it to other animals in a genus or anything like that. It's a somewhat arbitrary ordering. Zip codes, on the other hand, are kind of interesting, right? You hear someone's zip code, you know something about them. If it starts with a one, I kind of assume they live in New York. Even if they don't, I knew it's New York-ish. It's related, there's a neighborhood, and we kind of have a sense, even if we don't know the zip code, of the exact zip code, we know a little bit about where you are. There's a neighboring a proximity to it that's a value in this particular mapping from a place or a name to a number. 
This is what we call an embedding. Um, you don't need to know exactly what this is, but this is the basic mathematical structure of it. You get your input data, you do a little math transformation into something smaller. You want to represent it as a uh, unique way, and you're learning the process of representing that number in such a way that you can get the actual information back out. And there's been a history of these going back to 2013 that have, was really the first key insight in 2013 when I knew something was happening here. And I'll tell you why I knew that. Oops. Um, so convert text into a number. If you look at that number, it looks like an arbitrary number. But if you plot it on a graph, in this case mapped down into a 2D surface so we can look at it, it's actually in a much higher dimensional space, but hopefully this isn't too small. Notice similar ideas come together. Up here we have pepper, salt, mix, flowers nearby. Over here we have cup, cups, spoonfuls, tablespoons. All of this happened with no human direction whatsoever. Just that fill in the blank problem and telling the computer, figure out how you can best put these words into similar places so that we can get the same ideas back out. And what naturally emerges is this, what we call a semantic mapping. We know exactly the, we get some sense of the meaning out of this. Now it's not just cute that similar ideas like salt and pepper get mapped together, but also there's kind of spooky stuff that goes on here. Encode the, the, the words king, queen, male, and female. So you have four numbers now. Then take king minus male plus female, and the resulting number you get is very close to the word queen. Almost spooky that it has that gender relationship. You see the same thing in verb tenses and even the relationship of countries to their capital. The system kind of, on its own doing, just by solving that math problem, finds way of, ways of relating similar ideas, but also capturing their relationships and preserving that information in this numeric space that it has. The next big innovation is called the transformer. Google came up with this because they were trying to solve translation. Turns out it does a great job on translation and language in general. One of its key ideas is the attention mechanism. So it's a way of looking at a sentence and saying, what words are important? What words relate to each other? Um, the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. Understanding, like, what is chasing referred to? Is the criminal chasing the FBI, or is the FBI chasing the criminal? Those sorts of components are learned by the system, how to focus on different ideas. On the right is something I won't explain in great detail. Uh, it looks pretty intimidating if you're not familiar with ideas like the transformer, but this is all basic math done in a very particular way. And using this engine, uh, as the core of how to solve that problem is how all these language, large language models have really emerged. This is the key innovation, just scaled up through hundreds of compute years. There's a couple other mathematical tools we use, like gradient descent. That's the idea of like a skier at the top of the mountain looking for the base of the mountain. Here we have some sort of math problem. You want to find maybe the lowest point. You put a few marbles on that surface and see which ones fall to the bottom. We have a mathematical way of doing that that works really well. And so we can look through, uh, this is a, what, a three-dimensional space, easy to kind of picture. You can't picture a 700-dimensional space, but the algorithms can work on it, and the AIs can seem to quote, unquote, think in that way. So what caused this leap forward? How do we solve AI? We define this particular math problem. We use the machine learning techniques like the transformer to solve it. We run it for a very expensive uh, amount of compute time, and we get something out that then does almost magical properties, were it not for the fact that we know how it was made and we can inspect under the hood how it works. A couple of terms, AI, A-G-I, and A-S-I. AI is a buzzword used for marketing, used for anything, and I'm kind of fine with that because some of these tools are their own form of AI. But what we're most interested in, the real moonshot, is can we develop an artificial general intelligence, something that passes the Turing test, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's also an idea we should spend some time thinking about, an artificial superintelligence, something that not only is convincingly human, but is convincingly brilliant or somehow really novel and unambiguously beyond us, an expert in every field, an expert in every topic, capable of in instantly synthesizing amazing new ideas. Uh, there is something interesting there to talk about, but we also have to define very well what it means. I don't think uh, even the most advanced AI will just instantly solve the hardest problem, open problems in mathematics, you know? Goldbach's conjecture instantly solves. Humans haven't done that for hundreds of years. 
there's something more to like great innovation, but uh, super intelligence is worth thinking a little bit about. I'm not as scared of this as some of my contemporaries. I'm more scared about what human beings do with AI than what an AGI or ASI might do to us, but that part is just my opinion. So how do we measure this AGI? How will we know once we have it? And the only reasonable tool we have today was proposed back in the 50s by the founder of computer science, Alan Turing. In what was pretty well a great leap of vision, he recognized we can't talk about the innards of the machine. We can't say, oh, it has to have love, or it has to work like the brain, or it has to be this or that. When you think about what aliens might look like wherever they are, they could be incredibly exotic compared to us. So why can't the machine be exotic compared to us? The truest test is the same test you would test a psychic with or anyone else. Find a scientific way to take out all the, uh, put in the proper controls, take out the possibility of cheating and things like that. So Turing's proposal is quite simple. A human judge, like this guy here, walks into a room and through two computer terminals is having two conversations. One is with a person, acting like a person, could be any of you guys saying whatever you want, having a normal conversation. The other is a conversation with a machine. And the machine is instructed to deceive you. Its plan is to convince you that it is the human, and the other person is the machine. And so long as you can tell the difference, we can feel confident AGI does not exist. And despite gross misreporting in the media, even in good scientific media, the Turing test has absolutely not been passed yet. Uh, we might be getting close, but we are currently far from it. Uh, while there aren't a lot of formal ways to test this, I think anyone who genuinely goes and talks to ChatGPT will be impressed with it, but also recognizing that it is a machine, it is not a person, and a few simple questions will reveal that. At least today it does. This is the only good test we have, and there may come a day where we start doing lots of tests like these. Now the judge has to be doing it in good faith. There was a case a few years ago of a, a chatbot that pretended like it didn't understand English very well, and you know, a little sympathy for someone who doesn't know the language, it could come off like, oh, that's probably a person, but that's sort of a cheat. Um, you know, maybe a clever cheat, but no one would call a system that just says, I don't speak your language intelligent. That's, you know, easy to write in a few lines of code, really. Now, this threat of ASI that I kind of wrote off, there are a few concerns. Um, there's this notion of air-capped escape. We're really afraid of this. Why don't we just put it in a machine, in a room, no connection to the internet? let everybody get comfortable with it, talk to it, whatever. But uh, if some kind of way, there is this notion of a super intelligence that to us, or compared to it, we're like toddlers. And imagine a bunch of toddler jailers, and you're the adult. Would you talk yourself out of that cell? Probably eventually you would. Um, and that's the greatest, uh, I guess, convincing argument of if such a thing existed, that it's probably not containable. Uh, what would it do if it gets out, in the worst case, Probably some sort of biotech terrorism would be the best way, because it's not going to get hurt by a virus and engineers. Um, maybe incitement to violence through fake news, some sort of economic collapse if it does all the jobs, although I don't know who's buying the goods if there are no uh, income streams, but there are things to be thought of here. I'm not as concerned about this as I said. I'm more concerned about what a human does with this technology. And how does AI currently differ from humans? This is a quick list I came up with. No embodied it. I used to think that was important, that maybe uh, an artificial general intelligence had to you know, experience physics and the real world and the you know, abundant amount of signals and information around me. I'm no longer convinced that's necessary. AI or AGI, when it exists, doesn't necessarily have pain or emotions. Perhaps those will emerge along the way somehow, but we have no indication that that needs to be there. Today's AI has no motivation, and this is interesting, Although there are types of AI that have what's called a utility function. For example, uh, AlphaGo, that is now the world's best player at not just Go, but chess and checkers and a dozen or so other games. That one system just has the goal of maximizing its score, winning the game. So it has this notion of utility. It looks at every situation and says, how good am I doing and how do I maximize my score? There's not exactly the same concept in language models. They're just trying to produce realistic text there isn't an underlying motivation or a desire to get people to do things. That can be confusing when you hear about articles like the uh, reporter who was, the machine was telling it to leave his wife and be with the machine. Um, <laughs> that's just the consequence of the language found on the internet. So apparently those sorts of conversations are out there. <laughs> an interesting one that's uh, most notable for me, it has no long-term memory. 
While you can have a conversation, it'll remember things, you can reference back to them. All the AIs we have today have what's called a context window. You talk to it long enough and the early parts of the conversation start to disappear as the conversation shifts forward. That's possibly a fixable problem. There's clever things people are working on today to address that, you know, cute ways that the language model could maybe save some information and retrieve it or something like that. But uh, this is a major hurdle, a major difference between my brain and the current large language models. They are static systems. They don't update. Every update they do is explicitly done. They don't exactly learn. There's a training process where a company like OpenAI or Google invest lots of money and lots of compute resources to develop that uh, resulting language model. Once that's done, it's fully baked. You just use it from there. It never really learns until you train it again. Now we may get into a world where there's continuous training, but that's the current state. Um, perhaps the second most important uh, observation, there's no alignment. And this is a, an AI, we've dubbed the term the alignment problem. How do we ensure that the machines have the same goals and objectives we have? That's very easy to do when it's chess, right? Win the game, uh, protect the queen, these sorts of things. It's not easy to give an explicit definition of what you want for your economy or for social needs or things like that. So there's a lot of research going into this area, a lot of progress being made, but still open questions about how do we ensure that as these systems get smarter, they're always doing what we ask. Today we kind of ensure that because there's always a human in the loop. There's a person uh, deciding to deploy these models, monitoring the technology and things like that. Uh, maybe it'll be that way for a while, but if they become more autonomous, alignment is something to be considered. Um, two interesting ones, the machines can more easily rewrite themselves than we can. Imagine being able to delete memories you don't like or insert memories you didn't have before. The machines can easily clone themselves, right? It's easy to copy a file. Scary. Those are two things I can't relate to as a human being. Uh, so exotic properties of whatever we'll find going forward. So a couple of key takeaways. AGI is in no way considered impossible. There were times when people said, oh, well, it has no soul, it will never be like a human, or uh, you know, somehow there's incompleteness, girls, incompleteness theorem in math. There are a lot of flimsy arguments, but for the most part, and I think largely because we see how impressive some of these language tools are today, no one really genuinely thinks AGI is impossible. Are we on the right path? Are we on the staircase to the moon? Unclear, but more and more, uh, it seems to be pretty consistently believed in the AI community that we are on the right path. We just need to keep doing what we're doing. Point number three, AGI does not exist yet. There is no general intelligence. No one is passing that Turing test. Uh, it is our only test, so it's something we should always consider, and as you talk to these things, think for yourself, does this seem human, or can I tell instantly, or after a question or two that I'm talking to a machine? And then this superintelligence idea, something to be skeptical of, but something also worth considering. So, what happened recently with AI? We had this big leap forward due to hardware, data, algorithms, and most importantly, scale. Take the basic ideas and run them up to the moon. What other leaps might we see? Most of what I think is coming in the next few years is what I call last mile solutions. So we have this amazing technology. How do we get it into everything? Maybe not your toaster, but get it into a word processor in a more elegant way. Get it into QuickBooks. In all these places, it can be helpful for people. There's tons of work to do there, even if there's no more innovation, if we hit some sort of dark ages or AI winter where we just kind of make no further progress, there's still plenty to do in making our lives better and easier with the technology we've recently gotten hold of. Uh, video generation is something that's uh, right around the corner. Today, deep fakes are still kind of awkward, and you, know, you can tell that they're somewhat fake when they're video, at least. Images are damn near perfect. We're gonna see the same thing from video very soon. Um, personalization, these will start to learn who you are, speak to you in your terms. You want to talk to it about a particular field, like let's say chemistry, it will recognize, do you have a degree in chemistry or are you a complete novice, and talk to you in appropriate ways, learn who you are and interact with you. And then the one I skipped, multi-step planning. Today an AI could be useful for helping rewrite a Wikipedia page, like give it a sentence and say, rewrite this in a more neutral tone, or rewrite this and clean up some of the grammar. But it can't easily go out there, find a citation, evaluate the quality of the citation, double check that, and construct a whole thesis and logical argument. Those are things outside of the current technology's uh, abilities, but 
that may be around the corner, this multi-step planning. And lastly, how close are we to AGI? It's unclear, but we might not be terribly far away because there are no obvious reasons why we're off the path. We just don't know how many steps are left. And that's that, if there's any questions. Great question, yeah. Energy is a big concern. Um, GPT-3, the one that you know, has been out for a while, um, I believe somebody told me it costs about $60,000 to train it, and that's basically the energy cost. Well, the energy cost and the renting of the computers. Um, I kind of merge that into one thing of just the dollars it takes to make these things. Computers are getting more and more energy efficient all the time. I think we'll, you know, I'm not a hardware guy that'll continue and we'll see the, the price dropping and dropping. That's the natural sort of trend of industry. But yeah, it's very expensive, not just in terms of the hardware, but also the energy that goes with these things. Now there isn't like a ceiling there. It isn't that we're gonna find out, you know, to travel the speed of light requires an infinite amount of energy, I think, to accelerate to it. There's no such asymptote with AI. It seems as we double what we put into it, we get at least double back out. Until we don't. <laughs> Until we don't, right. <laughs> well, what about, I've recently heard like the New York Times is putting out a copyright infringement lawsuit. Yes. Um, what do you see that as impacting the future? It's interesting. So the New York Times suing OpenAI. Um, I don't have any insider information, but the people I listen to say that that will probably get settled for about a nine-figure sum plus some ongoing, like, paying a fee every year for the content. Um, it's something that isn't for computer scientists to decide, I don't think. The legal system and our culture has to decide what we do when these things can instantly copy an artistic style or a writer's style or take content from a newspaper and then be able to put the writers out word or something like that. Um, it is a contemporary topic our culture is going to have to decide. And I think this battle with the New York Times is the right first legal step. Carol? about how, and uh, this is very new, so this idea that someone could talk to a computer to see if it's human or not. I was wondering if the computer could be programmed to be deceptive. Like if you say, are you carbon based? It's sure. Like In fact, it'll have to be deceptive. That's part of the Turing test. Um, it's only going to plug over your power. What's going on? Uh, we're going to plug your laptop in. Power's on instead. Oh, well, that was weird to me. So if, um, yeah, so think of this test. How do we know which is the computer? If, if it has to tell the truth, just ask, are you the computer? The game is over. So by definition, the machine has to be clever. It has to think about what you're thinking about. And when you ask a question, it has to second guess you. And there's a cognitive load to all that. It's hard to be deceptive. And are people programming, so, so humans are programming the machine to be deceptive? Not directly. The humans are asking the machine, will you please pretend to be a human? And the only way to reach that goal is to learn on your own how to be deceptive. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned about the so-called hallucinations that sometimes these AI or language models come up with. I don't know sure. how they make those connections to actually go off path and hallucinate these various scenarios. Is that the way they're trained? or? So it's a consequence of that, the idea of predict the missing word. So all these systems are trying to do is predict what word comes next, and they're shockingly good at it. But it's easy to also spot nonsense, right? To make up a silly story about a, you know, finding unicorns in South America or something like that. Um, as much as that is a contemporary problem we all should worry about, I think that's a short-term problem for a couple of reasons. Uh, two in particular. One is that there's another layer to all this called RLHF, Reinforcement Learning with Human Feedback, that doesn't get talked about as much. Basically, everything you talk to the language model, there's like a filtering step. If you go and ask it to tell you how to make a pipe bomb, it won't do it. Uh, ask it to say something nice about Hitler, it won't do it. Um, there are all these controls in place where the, model, the underlying technology might do that, but companies like OpenAI have put another layer on that says, uh, have a human look at these answers and rate, is this a good answer or not? And thumbs down for unethical things, thumbs down for pipe bombs, thumbs up for good explanations, and enough training, and there's this extra like uh, human built filter that shows up there. So that's part one, is the uh, human in the loop reinforcement learning. Part two is that when we want truthful systems, which we don't always, right? Maybe we want to write fiction books, those are entirely contrived and hallucinated. But if you want factual material, there'll be auxiliary systems that help 
you know, cite and give facts. We're already seeing some citations show up in these tools. So think of the large language model as the engine of the car. We also need the exhaust and the transmission. And some of those tools will fight away the hallucinations, and I think that'll be a short term problem. Kyle, if I could add something. Yeah. Um, so at some level, you're asking the wrong question. So the question isn't why does it hallucinate? The question is why does it ever get anything right? <laughs> because it's not actually learning or understanding anything. All it does is based on the gigabytes of data it's been given, give what is likely to be a good next word. It's only because of the sort of residual reality that is in the in that whole average of text that it gets anything right. So really think of it the other way around. It isn't that it occasionally hallucinates. It's that it's shocking that it gets anything right ever. <laughs> All right. If you look on the internet, most of what's there is wrong. Right. Except on Wikipedia. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have to end it there. I want you to understand, uh, how we, we could have Kyle talk for ages. This is why Kyle has been at every one of our skeptic camps, and I really appreciate you driving up. take a very quick break. Uh, be back in seven minutes, so uh, please go and do your things and come right back. I'm up. Thanks.